Welcome back folks. It's time for our next 300 Winchester Magnum video. The main topic of today's video is going to be this guy right here. This is the 200 grain Sierra Match King, but this is the number 2231. There are two different 200 grain Sierra Match Kings and they are wildly different. This bullet is crazy. It's like three feet long. Here it is lined up. Let's see, on the left is the 220 grain Sierra Match King that we've been shooting quite a bit of in our previous 300 Win Mag videos. And then this crazy 200 grainer. And on the right is the 240 grain Sierra Match King that we've also shot quite a few of. You'll see that the 200 grainer is the longest one. The bearing surface is super short. The ogive is massive. So that's why on the box, you'll see that this bullet has a nine twist or faster label on it, just like the 240 grain bullet. Now our 300 Winchester Magnum is a one in 10 twist. So we're hoping these are gonna stabilize like the 240s. We've shot some of the 240s and they've shot really, really good. We've shot some of our very best groups with the, the 240s in this gun with our 10 twist barrel. So hoping that this nine twist or faster warning here is more for 308 shooters. Hopefully we're gonna be okay here in the 300 Winchester Magnum. Th this was a requested bullet from one of my supporters over on Patreon, and he has since tried it and not had very good luck at all. His groups have been bad. So I'm not gonna get my hopes up today. This could be a complete disaster. Our overall lengths are going to be crazy. Now we know with, with 300 Winchester Magnum, the, the normal standard SAMI overall length is 3.340. And with our 220 and 240 grain Sierra Match Kings, we've been shooting 3.475. So 125 thousandths longer than that SAMI 3.34. Well, if you look in the Sierra manual for this 200 grainer, their recommended overall length is 3.700. That is 360 thousandths longer than the standard overall length for 300 Win Mag. So these are absolutely going to be single feet only. There is no chance we could fit these in our magazine. So we can just forget about that right off the bat. So I did test them a little bit ago to see what the maximum overall length is in my gun, you know, before the bullet hits the rifling. And I came up with 3.780. So I think we're gonna shoot two different overall lengths today. We'll shoot 3.7 and then we'll shoot them out at 3.775 maybe, just to, you know, five thousandths off the lands and we'll see what happens. But I'll tell you what, before we get to any of that, before we even really discuss our load data, we've got a couple other things going on here with 300 Winchester Magnum that we need to talk about. Now our last 300 Winchester Magnum video was a bit of a joke. It was the accelerator sabos. But before that, the previous video was we were testing out the bedding job in the Boyd stock and things were good. Like the gun was back to shooting pretty good and felt pretty good about our stock. I've done a little bit more work on the stock. The first thing is this magazine catch here. If you have this Boyd stock, you know that the standard Boyd's magazine catch is plastic and it floats around and you gotta align it just right to get your magazine to go in. It's basically like a huge plastic washer. Well, Super Dave, maker of the world famous lump, maker of the world famous grease gun adapter for removing stuck rounds from chambers. You guys know Dave, right? Well, he made me a metal magazine catch. I sent him the measurements and the thickness I needed and he made me one out of metal and I have actually bedded this metal magazine catch into the stock. I've got it making really good contact with the front pillar. So now we've got the pillar making good contact with the barrel, and then the pillar makes contact with this metal magazine catch. So solid metal on metal on metal here at the front. So I am so happy with how this turned out. I am never again gonna have to worry about adjusting that stupid thing to get my magazine to fit. It's in there permanently. I don't have to worry about the stupid magazine fitment with that crazy Boyd's catch. So thank you so much to Dave. He did an awesome job with that. The other thing I did on the back end with the trigger guard, I bedded underneath. It's actually kind of a really tight pressed in fit now. I dug that out a little bit and bedded the trigger guard into the stock. So the trigger guard is now making excellent solid contact with the pillar and the bedding material. So nice metal on metal on metal connections at both the front and rear action screws. I think I'm done messing with this stock now. This should be its final form. Now, the other thing we need to talk about 
If you remember two videos ago, we had a piece of Hornady brass that nearly got a case head separation. There you go, you see that line right there? And in that video, I was talking about maybe trying to find some way to chop this guy lengthways or something so we can inspect it. That's a little bit crazy, but what I wanna do, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do that, but what I can do is just go ahead and chop it off so we can get a better look there. And as you can see, I haven't messed with it. I didn't wanna look ahead of time. So let's chop this dude off. Let's look inside of this guy and see what the inside of this case fail failure looks like. All right, so I pulled out my little chop saw that I use for cutting 223 to make 300 blackout. This ought to do the job. All right, there we go. That is hot. That's hot. All right, let's see if we can get a look down inside of here. And I'll tell you what, it looks like this edge closest to us here is where the failure happened. I need some light, don't I? All right, let's see if this helps at all. Yeah, look at that. Follow it around, doesn't look too bad. And then there on that side is a big old crack. Now I pulled out a, uh, a dental pick here, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to, like there's a, there's a groove. Of course there is right there where the crack is. Yeah, let's find it again. There it is. Okay, so that side. So of course, on that you know side we can feel the crack, no problem. But all the way around it, you can feel that groove where the brass is thinning. Yep. And I tell you what, let me pull out a brand new piece of Hornady and we'll chop it just so we can kind of see what it looks like down there. All right, so I actually chopped two more pieces. The first one is brand new. And hopefully you can see there is nothing, there's no groove, there's no anything. It's just straight brass. If I'm not getting this on camera here like I think I am, I'll, I'll take some pictures and insert them later maybe because, yeah, this sort of thing's hard to, hard to get on camera. This piece is one from the same batch as our failed piece, but this one did not show anything, no exterior signs of fatigue. And there's definitely a little bit of that groove in there, but it's not nearly as bad, like not nearly as bad. This piece that failed, like it's extremely distinct all the way around. Like, you know, you can see it. And here's the, the piece that did not have any signs of failure. Like that same ring in the same place is there. It's just not nearly as bad and of course like i said our new piece nothing there so i don't know like i've always heard about people doing this like reaching down inside of cases and feeling for this this is really the first case head separation i can remember having in a long time i generally retire my brass i'm a little bit conservative about it i retire my brass a little earlier than i should a lot of times so i don't have a ton of experience with this sort of deal and i'm just i'm, I'm trying to get a feel for is this something i could predict by like, okay, here's, here's a piece of Norma. This is the Norma we've been shooting throughout this series. I think we've got three firings on it. And if I reach down into this and just kind of probe around and feel around, it does feel like there's some, th this one has a little stiffer end on the other side. Maybe I can feel a little bit better with this one. Like I do feel something kind of like a groove forming, but nothing like, you know, here where like your, your pick almost catches on it. It's not like that. This is the one that didn't show the failure. It's maybe kind of something like this. I don't know. This is hard to, it's hard to explain. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what these failures look like. Certainly educational for me. And every time you're trimming brass off of a case mouth, that's where you need to imagine it coming from. Because this case is stretch, this area, this is the source. All right, let's move on. Let's get to loading. So like I mentioned earlier, I don't have very high hopes for accuracy with this 200 grain Sierra Match King. Hopefully it'll prove me wrong. Hopefully it'll be amazing, but I'm going into this a little bit pessimistic. So I want to shoot some kind of like some verification loads because, you know, I already mentioned the additional stock work that I did. If I somehow screwed something up, I want to know it and I don't want to blame the bullet. You know what I'm saying? So let's shoot some of the 240 grain Sierra Match Kings. We've had very good luck with this bullet in this gun 
we've shot some of our very best groups. So I want to shoot just two groups. So we'll, we'll load up 10 of these just to, you know, just to check our platform. We're going to stick with the same overall length. We've been shooting with these with just 3.475 inches, uh, which is a 2.9 inch cartridge based ogive measurement. I want to shoot the same load we shot two videos ago, which is 66 grains of Reloader 23. It shot a crazy good group. It was like a 0.4 or 0.5 inch group, something like that. So I have high confidence that this load is capable of shooting a good group. I also want to shoot 69.5 grains of IMR 7977. We haven't shot this combination before, but the 7977 shot pretty well with the 220 grain Match King. So I just want to try it out with the 240 and yeah, 69.5 grains of IMR 7977. So that's 10 shots. With the 200 grain Sierra Match King, I think I already mentioned, I wanna shoot two different overall lengths. I wanna shoot 3.7 inches, which is what Sierra recommends, and I wanna shoot 3.775, which is just five thousandths off the lands in my gun. I wanna shoot the same two powders. Reloader 23 will shoot 71.5 grains, and 79.77 will shoot 76.5 grains. All of this data comes from the Sierra manual, and I'm backing off of max just a little bit, like a couple grains of powder off of max. So with these four loads, if we get anything resembling good accuracy, then we'll follow up maybe in the next video, we'll kind of do a more thorough workup with one powder and shoot some more charge weights and, and all of that stuff. But here for today, I just kind of want to pull out a couple random charges, shoot them at a couple different overall lengths and see what happens. The brass, in case you missed the accelerator Sabo video I did, I'm moving on to some new Norma brass, right? Our Hornady batch is done. I'm gonna trash that whole batch and we're gonna go ahead and move on to Norma. I've got 30 pieces of brand new Norma. These were fired once with those accelerator Sabo loads. So these will be their second firing. I did go ahead and anneal them. You might notice they are annealed. So these guys still need resized and everything. So I guess that's what we'll get to next. With primers, I think I'm gonna make a primer change. So far we've been shooting the CCI 250 large rifle magnum primers and not a lot to complain about we've seen some decent accuracy in our gun but i was able to pick up some of the federal gm 215 m's the large rifle magnum match primers from federal a lot of you guys told me this was a really good magnum uh, primer so we're going to give them a shot for the first time here today so i think that pretty much covers it step number one here is going to be to resize our brass so let's get to that so I pulled out the Hornady Headspace Comparator gauge thingy, and I've been looking at the numbers that I'm getting from this brass. If you watched that last video with the accelerator Sabos, you'll know some of those loads were really goofy. Some of them were low pressure, and I had a feeling some of them might not have like properly fire formed, and that's exactly what I'm seeing. The long number I'm seeing is right at 2.279. Yep, here's the next one, 2.279. So these, the ones that are 2.279, properly fire form to the chamber, I believe. But I'm getting some of them that are 2.276. Here's one that's 2.274. Now this was important because if I set up my sizing die with one of these and I bump the shoulder, you know, one or two thousandths with this, then that would mean a bunch of them would be bumping the shoulder five or six thousandths, which is what we don't want. So we're gonna make sure we're using long ones to set our die. Speaking of dies, we're gonna use the Hornady custom grade full length sizing die from the same kit we've been using. And I'll tell you what, if this batch of brass doesn't last, that might be where we look next is, you know, the dies and stuff. I really wanna be careful with my sizing operations with this batch of brass. I'm just a little bummed that that Hornady set of brass only lasted, what was it, five firings? I thought we'd get a little bit more out of it. So I'm gonna be on the lookout for problems I might be causing. Don't want to over oversize this brass. So, okay, I screwed it down until it touched and then backed it out just a little bit. So I'm, you know, the die's a little bit up off the shell holder right now. So this first piece, I did uh, hit these with some Hornady one-shot lube and gave them time to dry. So hopefully we're in good shape here. It takes a lot of force to get up into this die. So maybe that's part of it. Maybe we just got a die that's a little bit too tight for my chamber. And what I should probably, this might be the perfect opportunity to buy a custom die from like Widden. You send them a couple pieces of fireform brass and they cut a die specifically for your gun. You know, we might look into that. All right, so this now is longer than it was. 
It's now showing 2.285. So we definitely didn't touch the shoulder, but we hit the body so much that the, the case kind of stretched up a little bit. So let's bring this die down a good little bit. All right, let's try that setting. All right, this one started out at 2.279 and now it's at 2.278. So we might have actually already hit a uh, good number there. Let's see how much this next case stretches. Right now it's 2.616. So let's size it. Yep, and after sizing, it's now 2.621. So the case stretched five thousandths. Go back to that first piece we've already sized once and run it back through again. And it's reading 2.280 now. Yeah, I might need just another little touch. It's 2.280. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna see if it'll chamber. I'm gonna see if all three of these will chamber. And if they will, I'm just gonna go with this die setting. Yep, they all three chambered no problem, so we're gonna go with this die setting. And roll with it. Now, I pulled out the, the Larry Willis die, right? The, uh, the collet die for sizing right above the belt. And I had a feeling these weren't going to need it. Remember, the, the top part of this die acts as a case gauge to tell you whether you need to use it or not. And none of these need, uh, need done. Because the rounds, are, you know, the shots we fired in this brass before with those accelerator sabos, they just weren't, they weren't high enough pressure to make it matter. So I'm running into a couple pieces of brass that's just barely over the max length. Like they're 2.620 is our max length. Yep, that one is also a thousandth over. So yep, need to do a little bit of trimming. I hate how hard that resizing die is having to work. I think that's probably what's going on. Is that resizing die is just a little bit too small for my chamber. It's causing more work to the brass during resizing, which makes it stretch more, which means I need to trim more, and which means we end up with case head separations after just a few firings. I need to ponder this. I think before the next video, I'm gonna have a different sizing die. Even if it's just a neck sizing die, like maybe we do that, just neck size for a while, because the custom dies I was talking about, those have a really long lead time. So if I order one of those, it's gonna be several months to get one. I don't know. I'm gonna think it over. Now for trimming, I recently picked up the Lee case length gauge and shell holder for 300 Win Mag. These are so easy and they're cheap. And it seems like every time I'm doing 300 Win Mag, I'm only doing 25 or 30 pieces. And it's really a huge pain in the butt to pull out something like the Frankfurt Arsenal case trim and prep center. These little kits, you need this, which is caliber specific. And then there's also a cutter. Yeah, this is the cutter and the lock stud, which is the black part there. You can get both the cutter and lock stud plus your case length gauge and shell holder for like 10 or $12 or something. The length gauge screws down into the cutter, just like that. And a piece of, piece of brass goes into the shell holder and gets tightened down. And you can either do this by hand or chuck it up into a drill to make things faster. But this piece goes down and the little pokey end sticks through the flash hole and bottoms out there. So down it goes, a couple twists, and your piece of brass has been trimmed. It's very easy, very fast. It's not adjustable though, so hopefully this puts us somewhere right around 2.610. They are generally pretty close. 2.613, perfect, good enough. So then after that, I'll hit that case mouth with a chamfer and deburr, and that one's ready for a primer. All right, so trimming is done. All the case mouths have been deburred and chamfered. I did go ahead and wipe the lube off the cases, although that Hornady one-shot lube I used, you're supposed to be able to just leave it on there. It's not supposed to mess with the powder at all, but eh, whatever. So now, obviously, I've moved on to priming. I'll tell you one thing. I've been talking a lot of good things about this Lee hand priming tool, and it's starting to drive me a little bit crazy. We'll see if it'll do it this time. So I just put this primer in, and I'm ready to take the cartridge out. So I let this go, and of course, it works perfectly that time. Try this again. Here's the next one. Did you see how that, the like carriage hung up there for a second? It started to do that on me a bunch. And I can't figure out what the heck is causing it. 
So like that time it didn't load the next primer, so. Don't know what the heck's going on with this thing. Yeah, there it did it again. See, I just put this primer in and now the little carriage thingy didn't pop back like that. Tell you what, the quest for the perfect hand priming tool never ends. They all seem to have their problems and quirks or limitations. So hopefully this isn't a bad idea, switching from the, the CCI primers that have been doing a good job for us over to these Federals. I don't think it will be. You know, these Federal gold medal match primers are always pretty good stuff. And I'm plus, I'm doing it because you all recommended these primers. So if they suck, I could just blame you. All right, there's the last primer. So we are ready for powder. One thing I pulled out, I forgot to mention it earlier in the video. I can't recall whether I mentioned this in a previous video, but I did buy 50 pieces of this Jageman brass. It's priced similar or maybe just a little bit better than Hornady. It's available over at uh, Natchez Shooter Supply, or I'm sorry, Natchez Shooter Supply. Natchez Shooter Supply is located in Natchez, Mississippi. It rhymes with matches. And I always say Natchez because, well, that's just the way my brain wants to pronounce it. But this, this Jageman brass, is available over there, the price is pretty good. I tried their little 25 ACP pistol brass and it was pretty good stuff. And I decided to pick up some of their 300 Win Mag because you know, our options are limited. It seems to be pretty well made. It's made in Wisconsin. There we go, premium brass made in the USA. I don't know, we'll give it a try. And it's got a name that's tough to pronounce, but over on their videos and stuff, uh, they, they pronounce it Jageman. We'll probably just call it JAG because that's what's on the head stamp. So once we're done with this batch of Norma, we'll probably try out the JAG next and see how it does. All right, next up, I just need to weigh out our powder charges. So let me do that. I'll see you guys over at the bullet seating die. We'll see if we run into any problems with bullet seating on these 200 grain Sierra Match Kings. With that O-Jive shape, I'm hoping we've got a seating stem that's gonna fit halfway decent. So I'll see you over there. So I've got something I want to show off here while I'm weighing out my powder charges. Look at this funnel. This is a 30 caliber funnel from Precision Hardcore Gear. A viewer named TJ got in touch, said he wanted to send me a funnel, and this is what he sent. It is very nice. You can buy these in any caliber you wish. And one really good thing about this compared to something like the Lyman kit, where this is, it's awfully heavy, and when you sit it on a case like it, you know, it, it's heavy. It's extremely top heavy. This is extremely light. So as you're going from case to case, it's very easy to just leave it there while you're weighing your next charge. So you always know, you know, where you need to go, where with the Lyman generally, I have to dump my charge and then set it down and then dump my charge and set it down. Now the do downside is price. One of these funnels is about the same price as the entire Lyman kit that comes with, you know, different size inserts for all of your different calibers. But if you only load one or two calibers, then investing in some nice funnels might be worth your money. Comes in this nice little pouch. Yeah, look at that guy. There we go. Pretty cool. So thanks again to TJ. It, it's anodized aluminum, so there's no powder stickage problems or static issues. The powder just flows right through. Tell you what, when I first took it out, I thought, man, is that going to be big enough? And even with these big, you know, 70 plus grain charges for 300 wind bag, I haven't, you know, I haven't found it to be a problem at all. I haven't missed any and dumped powder all over the place. So pretty cool stuff. All right, so it's time to get started with bullet seating. We're gonna use the Hornady Custom Grade bullet seating die. We've got several seating stems, but before we get to seating stems, I just wanted to say what an idiot I am. I had completely forgotten that earlier in this series, we got the Hornady Match Grade bushing type full length sizing die. I don't know that it necessarily would have been, you know, a better choice earlier when we were full length sizing, but I'm doing these stupid 300 Win Mag videos so intermittently, and it's going months and months between reloading sessions that I'm forgetting where the heck we're at in the process. So, okay, I'm an idiot. So we got to find a bullet seating stem that's going to fit this big old honking thing. And luckily I've got several options. We've got the one, the standard one that came with the 30 caliber custom grade die. I think this is it. That's actually not too bad. 
it's nice and deep so the the tip doesn't seem to be bottoming out i was worried about that here's another stem yeah see this one look at that the me plat of the bullet is bottoming out down inside of there that would be a disaster if we tried to use that one i've got the stem for the 230 and 250 grain a tip we're going to be testing the 230 grain a tip here in an upcoming video with the uh 300 wind mag oh yeah that's i think that's a little bit better here's one really good thing about the, these newer stems they started putting the part number on them the earlier ones well like the two we've just tested earlier they have no markings whatsoever and uh, yeah who knows what the heck they are so the a-tip stem looks to be a pretty darn good fit so that's our best bet so far i've also got the kind of the standard eldx stem or at least i think it is that one's not bad the tip of our bullet is not bottoming out so it's better than that one so but yeah it, it doesn't feel very good so it really comes down to this one which i think was the first one we looked at not awesome so i think the yep the atep stem is going to do the trick for us sweet and let's see how this same stem fits the the 240 grain yeah that's not good at all so we're definitely going to need a different stem for this bullet that one sucks that one is pretty good and this is the eldx stem that's terrible okay i think we're in business here with this one this is what we've used in the past i believe sweet so i'll tell you what first of all let's get these 240 grainers done first so to set our die i'm going to run well first i'm going to put the seating stem in there and the micro just adjuster thingy on top there we go that's a better angle okay so we run a piece of brass up into the die need to bring it up a little bit higher all right the brass is all the way up now let's screw it down until it touches there it is right there and back it out a little bit over a turn so we can see our adjustment scale there on the side so let's back out the adjustment to about right there and let's seat our first 240 grain sierra match king hopefully that isn't too short okay so our goal with the hornady bullet comparator got our 30 caliber insert in there is a 2.9 inch cartridge based ogive measurement yeah crap i already went too short i'm 20 thousandths too short i didn't back my adjuster out enough so there's 10 and 20 poop poopy poopy let's seat the next one see what that looks like the next one's pretty close we're a half thousand short 2.8995 that is completely good enough for me our total overall length should be around 2.475 this one's a little bit sh short 2.469 let's try the next one and see what we get same cartridge based ogive 2.8995 also a little bit short of our overall length guesstimate 2.468 but that's fine not a big deal so what i'm going to do with the one that i seated too short i'm going to throw it in this kinetic bullet puller yeah there it is and i just want to see if i can get it to budge a little bit i don't want to completely remove the bullet i just want to stretch it back out and then we'll seat it down to where it needs to be and then i'll mark it so we know which one it is so yeah let me get the dies out of the way i'll hit the center of my press here all right let's see if that did anything oh yeah looks like it did Yep, you can actually see on the side of the bullet the uh yeah scuff marks there whatever so we'll go ahead and reseat it we'll see what the numbers come out to yep now it's at the right cartridge based ogive number and i'm going to take a sharpie and mark up the bullet here so we know which one it is if it shoots into the group great if it doesn't then we ignore it not a big deal okay now we need to switch out our seating stem so we remove our micro just and i've got a big long allen wrench here that i can kind of feed up in there and push it out the top there it is and we drop in our new our new stem i usually kind of like to bounce this a couple times to get it to fall down into where it needs to be we reinstall the micro just and we're ready to rock now if i'm thinking about this correctly the bullet's going to be so far up inside of the seating stem 
that we're probably going to need to be have this cranked way down to hit our number. But just to be safe, in case I'm thinking about this backwards, which is always possible, I'm going to back this guy way out and we'll start from there. This is our first time working with this bullet, so we don't have a target cartridge based ogive number yet. We're just looking for an overall length of 3.7 inches here on our first ones. Yep. The seating stem isn't even hitting the bullet, so let me crank it down a little bit. All right, I feel some tension, so I'm going to drop the ram and drop this about eh, 70 thousandths or so. All right, so we're currently at 3.895, so 195 thousandths long, 50, 100, 150, 60, 70, 80, 90. We'll see what that gives us. Okay, good. 3.708. We'll go ahead and seat a couple of them and take an average, see how much more we need to move our adjustment. All right, there's the first three. Yeah, this first one, 3.698. So that first one I was measuring might've just been a long bullet or a, you know, a long me plat. The next one is right at 3.7. Yep, and that first one, 3.707. And if we look closely at the tip of this bullet, it's easy to see, look how crooked that guy is. Got a little long side to it. So that's why we got a long number there. Cartridge based to ogive, we're looking at 2.821. Yep, 2.821. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna come down one thousandths and we'll call it 2.820. Let me write that down. Run these guys back through. Right on the number, 2.820. Now I did get a little bit of markings on the bullet here, just a shiny ring where primary contact was between our seating stem and the ogive. So that's not ideal, but it seems okay. None of these loads are gonna be compressed. We're not putting an unnecessary amount of force on the bullet. Our neck tension seems reasonable. So the bullets are seating pretty smoothly. So I don't think it's gonna be causing us any issues. So there's the first 10, no problems there. So our next overall length is going to be 75 thousandths longer at 3.775 in that neighborhood. So let's come out 75 on our die. There's 50, 60, 75. And I'll tell you what, we'll go 76 just for the heck of it and seat the first one. And our number should be 2.895 and that's right where we're at. We're about a half thousandth longer than 2.895. Our total overall length should be in the 3.775 neighborhood, and it's 3.776 here with this first bullet. All right, let me write down that 2.895 inch cartridge based ogive, and we'll just roll with this setting. You know, even at this extremely long overall length, the, the bullet seating depth is still okay. Like the, the base of the, the bottom of the bearing surface, it's over halfway down the, the neck. It's probably more like three quarters of the way down the neck. I'll throw a picture up here with our split case that kind of shows you where the base of the bullet is at this length. So it shouldn't be a big deal. Plus, you know, we're going to be single feeding these by hand. So it's not like they're going to have a rough trip through a feeding, you know, operation. So it shouldn't be a big deal. So I think that's it, folks. Last one. Let's get on the range. All right, folks, time to get started. Our target is at 100 yards. This is a Thompson Center Compass chambered in 300 Winchester Magnum. I mentioned earlier, it does have a one in 10 twist. So hopefully that doesn't cause us any problems. I think the gun is still zeroed, but I'm not 100% certain. So what I did is I grabbed a box of factory ammo I had laying around. This is some Federal Gold Medal Match with the 190 grain Sierra Match King. This should be enough to just fire a couple shots and make sure we're on target. So I've loaded three into the magazine. Let's see if we can hit where we're aiming. All right, that's pretty close. I wasn't sure, you know, because even if I hadn't messed with my scope settings, I have had the gun apart and the additional bedding work and all of that crap. You never know what might affect your zero a little bit. Let's shoot another one. All right, that's pretty close. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and move down. Yeah, we'll move down one minute. 
just to make sure we're not too high. That 190 grain ammo was higher velocity, probably had a little bit higher point of impact than we're gonna see with the other stuff anyway. So that might've been a stupid thing to do, but that's okay. So let's move on to our first load with the 240 grain Sierra Match King. The first one is 66 grains of Reloader 23. If you remember, this is the one that we marked the bullet. This is the one where I had to reseed it because I seeded it too deep. So let's see what happens. <laughs> That's like four inches low. Man, I can't believe I did that. Uh, that really sucks. Screw it, let's go ahead and shoot the group way the heck down there low. Why not? Ooh, wow. So the second shot hits where we're aiming. That's pretty bizarre. I can't tell for sure from here, but looking through the scope, that bottom bullet hole looks to be a little bit ragged. Maybe that bullet didn't stabilize. That's just weird. All right, let's go ahead and finish it out. Man, those are really nice velocity statistics. 2581, 2.6 feet per second standard deviation, and a six feet per second extreme spread. I'll tell you what, over here on shot marker, let's go ahead and hide the first shot. It's a 5.32 inch group, including that one, but if we get rid of that one, the upper four are a 1.18 inch group, which is not exactly fantastic, but it's not horrible. Man, that's really surprising. After this next group, I'll walk down and have a look at that bullet hole. That was just weird, man. Really kind of weird. So let's hope IMR 7977 gives a better showing. 69.5 grains is our powder charge. So let's see what happens. Gross. What in the heck is going on here? It's already up to a 1.7 inch group. Not exactly what we're looking for here. Wow, another one way down low and to the right. Gross, gross, gross. What in the heck? So I'm going to walk down, have a look at those bullet holes, put some pasty stickers over that lowest one so it doesn't interfere with our next groups and let the barrel cool down a little bit and think about what in the heck might be going on here. This is not good. All right, so I flattened out all of the bullet holes so we could see and this guy down low was definitely flying sideways. And if we look at like this guy right here, this guy right here, and maybe that guy a little bit and that guy a little bit, we're having stability problems today which is really blowing my mind. We haven't had any problems whatsoever with the 240 grain Match Kings up to this point. It's not that like cold today. The temperature's in the 40s. We did have a big weather system move in last night, like yesterday and last night. We had tons of rain and wind. I assume probably a low pressure system coming in. So maybe this is about, I don't know, barometric pressure. I, I'm a little bit confused and it really makes me worry about what we're about to see with the 200 grain Sierra Match King. But I guess it's kind of good. Like if we're walking the edge here with the 240 grain Sierra Match Kings, it's better to know it than not to know it, right? Like it's better to run into these problems during load development and testing than it is when you're out at a match or whatever. Huh, very interesting stuff. So I'm gonna paste up some of these guys so they don't interfere with our next groups. There we go. Let's get back to it. All right, so we're starting out with the 3.7 inch overall length and reloader 23, 71.5 grains. Let's see what happens. Okay, so far so good. Our brass looks good. Ah, that last shot screwed things up a little bit, but that's still a pretty good start, if you ask me. We ended up with a 1.28 inch group. The velocity was 2822, and I expect this next group with IMR 7977 to be a little bit faster than that. So even though this bullet is a little bit longer than the 240 grain Match King, it seemed to stabilize better. So that's that, I assume, that's that additional 250 feet per second that we're getting with the lighter bullet. 
So let's move on. This is that same overall length of 3.7 inches with IMR 7977, 76.5 grains of it. Oh, that velocity is actually lower. That first shot was 27.23. All right, this is not nearly as bad as I feared it might be. That was a 1.13 inch group. The velocity was down right at 100 feet per second, so we were down to 27.25, and they still st uh, seem to stabilize. Pretty interesting. All right, I need to take another break to let the barrel cool down, which won't take long in this weather. Okay, 10 more shots to go. Let's make them count. We're going up to 3.775 inches of overall length. And if I can get it in there, there we go. First up's the Reloader 23. 71.5 grains, same charge weight that we shot with the 3.7 inch overall length. All right, that first velocity was 28.26, and the average at our other overall length was 28.22. So it doesn't look like the velocity's changed much, you know, which if it had, that might give us an idea of some sort of pressure issue being up close to the lands or something. I don't know. The brass looks good, the velocity hasn't changed. Seems like we're okay. Now let's see if they'll group. Ah, crap. That one's back in there. All right. Uh, four out of five ain't bad. It's a little bit aggravating that it's a 1.00 inch group. Like, come on, it couldn't have been a 0.99 just to make us feel a little bit better. If it wasn't for number three, I'll tell you what, let's hide number three real quick. Yeah, the other four shots went into 0.41 inches. That shows some promise. That definitely shows some promise. Velocity 2832, which is 10 feet per second faster than it was at the shorter overall length. So no significant change, I would call that. So let's finish it off with IMR 79.77, 76.5 grains, 3.775 inches of overall length. Ugh, gross. Way up high and to the right. And then right back there with those other two. Good grief, that is crazy. I'll be interested to in inspect some of these bullet holes that screwed up some of our groups. Uh, three of the five through one hole and we end up with a 1.90 inch group. Gross, gross, gross. Let's see how tight those uh, those three are. So let's hide number four and hide number one. Yeah, those three went into a 0.21 inch. So there's promise here. Like there's absolutely promise. But overall, we'd have to call this a pretty disappointing range trip. All right, let's get packed up, get back to the bench. All right, quick look at the brass and it's going to be extremely quick because there's nothing whatsoever to show you. It all looks fantastic. A Little bit of primer cratering which is totally normal in both of my Thompson Center Compass rifles. Here's a couple more pieces. Yeah, nothing at all to show you. Although I must say, I'm a little bit worried about what's going on underneath. I'm starting to feel, you know, more and more like the sizing die problems we discussed earlier in the video are really the root of our problems. And we'll talk about that more here in just a minute. All right, so we got some pretty frustrating groups today. I've been making this stupid video for three weeks now. It's yeah, like, I don't know. A lot's going on, and it's just taken me a long time to get this video put together. So I've had a lot of time to think about the 240 grain Sierra Match King results, and I still don't know what the hell to think. That first shot in particular was clearly not the least bit stable, but we've got to keep in mind that was the bullet where I banged on that round with the kinetic bullet puller and then reseated the bullet. 
maybe that's why. Like, we didn't have any other shots that were quite as bad as that one. And the other shots that went a little bit low and maybe had some bullet holes that were a little bit, tiny bit wonky, they were nothing like that first shot. So do we ignore the first shot and think that, you know, maybe just something else was going on today, which I kind of want to talk about here in just a few minutes? Or do we say that the 240 grain Sierra Match King can no longer reliably stabilize in this gun and take it off the table completely and never shoot it again? I really don't want to do that because this, this bullet has shot some of our very best groups. So we're going to revisit the 240. Maybe we'll do a video with the 240 where we just start reducing velocity and see if we run into stability problems if we drop the velocities by two, three, four, five hundred 500 feet per second slower than what we've been shooting with this bullet up to this point. That might be a fun test. But today's results were certainly a little bit worrisome. Not only that one, but just the, the, the other groups or the other bullets that kind of stabilized weren't really trying to group like we've seen in the past. So that's not good news. But moving on to the 200 grain Sierra Match King number 2231, these bullets were trying to shoot. And particularly at that longer overall length at 3.775, we just had some flyers. You know, we didn't put together that group that I think this bullet is capable of in my rifle. So I'm gonna to choose to be happy with these results. You know, there's a lot of promise here. This certainly warrants further investigation and testing. I mean, I don't really have a purpose for this bullet. It won't fit in our magazine. I can't hunt with it. I don't really have a need for a super high ballistic coefficient bullet, but hey, they're fun to play with, right? So this is definitely not the last video we're gonna do on this number 2231 Sierra Match King. But moving on to our problems. Well, like I mentioned, I've been making this video for weeks and weeks now. I've already got a new sizing die in. I went ahead and picked up the Lee Collet neck sizing die. I didn't know, that, like this is the first uh, Lee die I've bought that came in one of these little cases. Like some of them come in these two piece clamshell type jobs. This is my uh, yeah, universal case expanding die. I kind of hate these cases. So I don't know if this style of case is new or if this is just how the Collet dies come, but I really like it. There's our die. There it is right there. So. Next video, we're probably gonna be neck sizing and we're gonna be using this here die. So I'm looking forward to that. I also bought another die. I went ahead and picked up the Widden click adjustable custom sizing die, the bushing type die. This is the one where I need to send them three pieces of fired brass and they make an, you know, a custom die. The lead time is 14 to 16 weeks. So four freaking months which seems long, but then again, like I only make a video every four months these days, it seems like. So I shouldn't complain too much. They are not cheap, folks. I went with the click adjustable one. It was $164.99. I think that's definitely officially the, the most expensive die I've ever purchased. And there are cheaper options out there. Pre pretty much any of the die manufacturers offer this sort of service where you send them brass and they make custom dies. So. It can be done a little bit cheaper, but I've always kind of wanted to try one of these wooden dies. I've always heard great things about them. So this seems like a really good opportunity. We've already got our neck bushings, right? Cause we've, we've got our Hornady match grade bushing type sizing die that we talked about a little bit earlier that I had basically forgotten about because I'm an idiot. But both that die and the standard fooling sizing die today, I think it's just, especially around the shoulder, I think my chamber is just either particularly big or these Hornady dies are particularly tight. I'm just oversizing the crap out of this 300 Win Mag brass. And I tried to show earlier in the video just how much force it was taken to get these, this brass into the die. It's, it's been that way since the beginning, but if you've been following along with this series, you'll know this is my first belted Magnum experience, right? This is the first Magnum gun I've ever owned. So I really didn't know what to expect. And you know, back at the beginning, I guess maybe I thought, okay, these are sizing a little bit harder than I'm used to because, well, the cases are much larger, more surface area. I don't know, everything's bigger, everything's bigger. So maybe a little more sizing force than normal is necessary. And you know, and I guess you know, now I've just kind of reached the point where I understand that's probably not what's going on. I probably just have sizing dies that are a very poor fit for my chamber. So Lee Collet die, the Widden die, that should get us all straightened out. The other problem, and this has kind of been slowly nagging at me, and somebody had finally mentioned it in the comments, 
If we go back my last couple months worth of videos where I've been using the Lyman eight station turret press, our groups have kind of gone to crap. So in the next video I make, I'm going to be switching back to the Hornady press, the Hornady single stage press I was using before we switched to this one. And I just kind of want to do a couple videos and see if my groups just generally tend to improve. And if they do, then I'll make a video where we directly, you know, we load some ammo on the Lyman press. Maybe we re, uh, load some on my Redding T7 and we load some on the Hornady single stage and compare the results. And this actually might be a good, uh, good reason for me to finally go out and buy a really nice concentricity gauge to compare these presses because I don't know. Like I say, I noticed it a while back, you know, just kind of started thinking like, man, I, I, we haven't shot some really amazing groups since I switched to this press. So don't, don't jump to conclusions. Take it for what it is right now. I'm a little bit disappointed in my recent results and we're going to switch presses. And if this press is a problem, I think you guys know I'll do my best to test it, prove it, and let everybody know. Well, just like today's groups with the 200 grain Match King, where we shoot three of them into one hole or four of them into one hole and then we just get a crazy flyer. It just seems like that's been happening a lot more than it used to. So we'll see how that goes. So is that about it, folks? I think that's just about it. Hopefully the, the wait for the next video won't be quite as long, but you know, who knows? I'll see you guys next time.